Access to the storyteller was strictly controlled. The door to the tree's hollow centre was not just hidden, it was locked. Edwin did his best to stake out the tree during the Pizzaplex's business hours. When crowds were thick by the tree, he was able to feel around the seams of the hidden door and look for a shielded lock or control panel, but he found nothing. The door seemed to be a little more than a cutout in the tree trunk, and he couldn't figure out how to get it open without being noticed by daytime security. Night security was far more relaxed, he knew. After hours, he might have a chance to get past the door. On the weekends, the pizza plex was open late, too late for any forays into the, to the storyteller's tree. Edwin had to wait until Monday night to attempt to sneak in. In the meantime, however, he decided he could gather some intel. Edwin had been part of Fazbear Entertainment for a long time. Therefore, the storyteller's tree aside, Edwin had access to pretty much every part of the executive building and all the company's properties. That access included the company's archives. After a project was completed, all the project plans were stored in a massive warehouse on the outskirts of town. Edwin always thought it ironic that a tech-savvy company like Fazbear Entertainment kept its records on hard copy copies stuffed into cardboard boxes and stacked, high and stacked sky high on metal shelves that seemed to go on for miles. But that was the way it was. And that was something Edwin could take advantage of. Mid-morning on Friday, Edwin got in his old compact sedan and put, put it out to the Fazbear Archives building. Shielding his eyes from a harsh sun, he buried, oh, buried? He hurried into the building and crossed a small, a bland beige lobby. Holding only a couple straight-backed plastic chairs and a long black formica topped counter, the tiny space would have, no, would have had no personality at all if it were not for the women behind the counter. The woman, large and ebony-skinned with shoulder-length dreadlocks, had done her best to spruce up her work area. A profusion of healthy houseplants flourished on a narrow table behind her, and a row of small versions of Fazbear characters were lined up on the counter. Next to a pint-sized foxy, a fuchsia uh, pottery bowl had a, held a profusion of multicoloured gumdrops. The candy's sweet aroma filled the air, so did the jasmine scent of the woman's perfume. When Edwin let the glass entrance door whoosh shut behind him, the woman looked up from a paperback romance novel. Eddie? The woman boomed in a Caribbean accent. I don't know what a Caribbean accent sounds like. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think of, like, Alexander Hamilton, I guess. Alexander Hamilton. Uh, that was Caribbean. Wait, Carib 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 Caribbean. There we go. That was Caribbean, right? He, he was Carib... I don't know. My favourite little guy. Hello, Chevelle, Edwin said. You're looking as lovely as ever. Oh, shut your mouth, Eddie. You're needing glasses. Chevelle flipped her orange beaded dreadlocks, and they clicked in time to her rhythmic laugh. Thankfully, my vision is 2020, Edwin said. All the better to see your stunning beauty. Chevelle trilled another laugh. Edwin winked at her. Chevelle had been the head records clerk of the archives for as long as Edwin could remember. What can I do for you today, Eddie? Chevelle asked. I was hoping you could let me poke around a bit, Edwin said. Poking around wasn't strictly kosher, Edwin knew. Chevelle, of course, knew that as well. Fazbear Entertainment had a precise procedure for accessing old records. Edwin could avail himself of the records anytime he wanted, but he was supposed to apply for the records and Chevelle was supposed to bring them to him. Edwin, however, didn't want to leave a paper trail revealing what he was up to. Thankfully, Chevelle really liked Edwin, and as he'd hoped she would, she winked at him and said, I don't see why not. It's not like I can even see you. Chevelle looked up and to the side like an innocent debunte, uh, debun debutante. <laughs> nah, -uh, I can't see nothing at all. I'm just going to mosey on over here. She wandered toward the door to the main archives. And I'm going to go check on a few things. If the door happens to close slowly behind me, who's to say what invisible thing might follow me in? Chevelle winked at Edwin again. He winked back and gave her a thumbs up. As soon as she hefted herself from her barstool high chair, he stepped around the counter, and when she opened the archive's door, he slipped through it behind her. Chevelle put her finger to her lips as Edwin bowed to her and pretended to doff an invisible cap. Then she backed out of the archives and returned to her position behind the counter. Edwin immediately headed down the nearest long cement-floored aisle. The aisles were oppressive. Edwin always thought, or Edwin always felt like, 
he was descending into catacombs when he was in the archives. A person could easily get lost forever in the maze of records. Thankfully, Fa uh, Edwin knew exactly where he was going. All Fazbear Entertainment records were filled chronologically. Within the chronology, they were filed alphabetically. It wasn't always possible to predict how a project would be labelled because Chevelle did the labelling, and sometimes she got creative with it. The storyteller specs could be filed under the Storyteller Creative Computer or some other title Edwin hadn't thought of, but since the time period was relatively compact, he was confident he'd find the records he needed pretty quickly. And he did. They were filed under Baobab, Edwin smiled. For the next half hour, Edwin Riff... Uh, right, riffled quickly through all the engineering specs for the fanciful Baobab tree. There has to be a way in, he muttered as he flipped through the schematics and notes. And there it was. Edwin grinned when he saw the sketch of what he'd been looking for. Well, wasn't that clever, he said. His words echoed through the colossal building. Once he found what he needed, Edwin skimmed through everything related to it. By the time he was done, he knew exactly how he could get into the Baobab tree to check on the storyteller. It was 11.22pm when Edwin made his way up the maintenance stairs to the top level of the roller coaster. Engineers are the bomb, he thought as he climbed the metal steps. The maintenance access to the Baobab tree was nothing less than inspired. Edwin's steps clanked on each tread. He wasn't concerned. He wasn't worried about being seen on CCTV either. This part of the building wasn't monitored. At the top of the roller coaster's maintenance stairs, a small corridor led to what appeared to be, at first glance, a dead end. Thanks to what he found in the archives, though, Edwin knew that the seemingly solid wall wasn't solid at all. Edwin confidently approached the wall and placed his hand on the upper right. As soon as he did, the wall parted. He's, he grinned. A pressure switch. Very smart. He'd hoped to find something similar on the tree trunk itself, but he hadn't been able to locate it. That was because it wasn't there. According to what he had read in the project files, the only way to get through the tree trunk door was by using a hidden palm scanner pad. The pad was programmed to accept only three palms. Mr. Burrow's palm, of course, was one of the three. Edwin's palm, obviously, was not. But he didn't need the stinking palm scanner. Thanks to the engineer's ingenuity, Edwin would get into the tree via the maintenance access, and that access, un assumed to be unknown and undiscoverable, was not protected by anything. Once the wall parted, Edwin spotted the control panel he would need. It was right inside the opening. He reached around the opening and pressed the button he found there. A soft hum preceded a click, and a telescoping catwalk extended out from the wall, heading toward the branches of the baobab tree. Once the tree was designed, Edwin had read in the project notes there'd been much discussion about how to access the tree's branches for maintenance. LED lights were long-lasting, but things inevitably went, wa went wrong, and the far ends of the branches might need repair. They would also need cleaning. The engineers who designed the tree included metal climbing rungs within the tree. These would allow maintenance people to get to the top of the tree, but the branches were far too fragile to be crawled on, so getting to the tips of them wouldn't be done from that central position. That was why the engineers built an extendable catwalk that could be stored within the network of roller coaster tracks and maintenance stairs and activated only when access to the tree branches was needed. The catwalk judded to a stop. It clicked again. The hum ceased. Edwin gazed along the length of the stainless grated walkway. Looking down to be sure no security personnel were strolling along the concourse, Edwin grasped uh, the catwalk's metal railings and stepped out onto the walkway. The catwalk shimmied over uh, ever so slightly, but it seemed sturdy enough. Uh, Edwin might have had his demons, but he wasn't afraid of heights. He didn't hesitate. He hurried toward the Baobab's trunk. Edwin knew the catwalk was 80 feet long, but the distance wasn't at all daunting. He was so buoyed by having found this access that all he felt was triumph as he strode toward the tree. He reached the tree trunk in no time. As he'd read in the Baobab's tree specs, Edwin found the end of the catwalk had self-anchored to the top of the tree. Just beyond the end of the catwalk, a sliding panel covered the top of the tree trunk. From what Edwin had read, the panel wasn't locked. No one had worried about a security breach from the top of the tree. Hey, security breach reference. <laughs> That's the first time we've actually heard security breach, like, be mentioned. Like, 
you know, like Help Wanted, we, we knew Help Wanted was like on the newspapers in FNAF 1, sister location. They even talked about sister location in, in the first few FNAF games, things like that. Uh, we never really heard about why Security Breach, I guess, is called Security Breach. I mean, there's there's a lot of different reasons why it might be, but here's, here's like a reference to the actual name of the game. <laughs> the panel, which had a hermetic seal, slid apart swiftly. Edwin peered through the opening and spotted the first of a series of metal rungs that acted as a ladder leading down into the tree. This was it. Edwin was about to gain access to the storyteller. And that thought brought with it Edwin's first frisson of fear. What if he was right? Edwin shook off the thought. There was no point in catastrophizing. Catastrophizing. <laughs> Yet. Edwin shifted to lower his foot onto the top rung inside the tree trunk. The rung was thick and sturdy. It felt secure. Edward lowered his other foot, feeling around for the next rung. He found it easily. Uh, I know, like, I think it's supposed to say Edwin, but it did say Edward right there. I don't know if that's important. That's probably just a mistake. From that point, Edwin was home free. He climbed down the 75-foot tree trunk just as quickly as he traversed the catwalk. As he climbed, Edwin kept his gaze forward. In spite of his ticker's problems, he was reasonably fit for his age. Even so, he wasn't about to risk falling. He concentrated on planting his foot carefully on each rung. His rubber soles did a good job of gripping the smooth metal, and they made a little sound. Or, yeah, they made little sound. He felt like a cat burglar. That thought made him smile. Edwin's smile, however, vanished instantly when he reached the bottom of the trunk. That was when he saw the storyteller, in all its glory, for the first time. He thought he was prepared for it. He was wrong. Um, Edwin had seen the tiger head, and so he knew what to expect, but it was worse up close. At a distance, carried by the three men, the tiger's head size was uh, discernible, but standing next to it, the head seemed to swell even larger proportions. Gleaming white, the metal tiger head was majestic, or it would have been if Edwin didn't know what it stood for. With eyes painted in two different colours, a deep emerald green and a brilliant blue, just like on the cover of Tiger Rock, the tiger's expression was blank, almost placid. The tiger, unlike real white tigers, hadn't been given stripes, and its nose and mouth were the same colour as the rest of the painted metal. The tiger's mouth was open, exposing not white but backlit silver teeth. Beyond the sharp canines, intermittently, blinking lights could be seen. Edwin understood he was looking at part of the storyteller's hardware. The lack of stripes wasn't the tiger's only non-tiger-like feature feature of the tiger bust, which was mounted on one curved yellow painted wall of the trunk's interior, also had four spread arms, which jutted from the tiger's neck, two slanted upward and two slanted downward. Edwin turned in a full circle and surveyed the contents of the hollow trunk. The interior of the tree trunk, he discovered, contained nothing but the mammoth tiger head. The stark vacant space was just a void above a round white floor, surrounded by a circular yellow wall. The floor and the wall, however, were covered with white LED lights. Blank, uh, banks of LED lights marched up the walls in soldier-like rows, and a spray of LED lights cascaded down from above the tiger's head. More LEDs were inset into the floor in a criss-crossing pattern. All that illumination bathed in four-armed tiger, uh, bathed the four-armed tiger in a way that made it radiant, almost celestial. The tiger's eyes sparkled in the light's glow, and the head's white painted surface gleamed. Edwin had to take a minute. Edwin retreated 12 feet to the trunk's far wall and sat on the tree's ceramic floor tiles. He took three long, deep breaths. The images were streaking through his mind again, the same way they had when he'd first seen the tiger head being carried into the tree. They were worse this time though, of course they were. The blank metal tiger head had triggered the old emotions, but this version of the tiger head was even more reminiscent of the one that haunted him. All the, all the usual symptoms of his panic attacks erupted at once. His breathing ratcheted up to a staccato beat. Sweat trickled down his neck. His stomach churned. He started to shake. Edwin closed his eyes and put his face in his hands. Stop it, he commanded himself. He didn't have time for this right now. He needed to see what he was up against. Edwin mentally smeared black paint over the pictures that were flipping through his mind. He forced himself to blot out his memories. It took a few minutes, but eventually his breathing slowed. The shaking stopped. Edwin opened his eyes. 
think like an engineer, he told himself. Edwin pressed a hand against the cold, smooth interior wall of the tree trunk and he stood. He took a step toward the tiger head and examined how it was interfaced with the wall. Was the tiger movable? Was it designed to be mobile? No. The tiger was stationary. It wouldn't suddenly come to life and attack. The tiger's head's workings did, however, have a substantial reach. It appeared to be hardwired to the tree. Um, and the tree was hardwired to all the pizzaplex systems. Edwin turned away from the tiger head and spotted a small inset in the wall. He found a compact computer terminal. Its keyboard slid in and out of the inset. Edwin pulled it out. Get ready, everyone. Big law drop right here. Of course, the storyteller's operating system was password protected, but Edwin didn't need to get into the system to learn what he'd come here to learn. What he had hoped he wouldn't find was right there on the start screen. The storyteller was running a program called Mimic One. That's right, my friends. <laughs> That's right. This is connected to the Mimic. Oh my god. <laughs> it's so good. It is so good. Oh, uh, is that what Glitch Trap is called then? Like, I, I have many theories about this, and we'll probably talk about it on the Dark Rooms podcast. But, um, oh my gosh. The the storyteller was running a program called Mimic One. I have a feeling Edwin, Edwin made the Mimic or something like that. And that's what he is so scared of. Anyway. No. Edwin whispered. His worst fears were confirmed. He'd known it. He tried to pretend he hadn't known it, but he'd known it. He'd known it from the very beginning. No wonder the Pizzaplex characters were changing. No wonder problems were cropping up all over. It was happening again, and Edwin had no idea what to do about it. Also, it was happening again is one of the thingies in Security Breach. One of the logs. One of the duffel bags. Edwin opened his eyes. He winced and closed them again. He groaned. As it always did on clear days, a sliver of blazing sunshine was piercing through the slats of Edwin's yellowed, sagging Venetian blinds. Unless clouds gave Edwin a reprieve, the sun speared him this way every morning, yanking him from the sweet oblivion of sleep, forcing himself to face existence yet another day. Edwin could have done something about the blinds, even though he was renting the ratty little apartment, he could have replaced the ancient metal window coverings, or he could have added to it, hanging room darkening curtains over it. For that matter, he could have just nailed a heavy blanket over the window, but he didn't do any of these things. Why? Because the light coming in through those blinds, however scourging it may be, was the only thing that got Edwin out of bed in the morning. Edwin, eh, Edwin rolled over on his narrow lumpy bed. With his back to the window, the light wasn't as intrusive, but it still nudged him to move. He threw back his sour smelling sheet and sat up. Edwin's knee joints cracked when he put his feet on the floor. His thigh muscles burned. For the last five nights, at Freddy's, <laughs> Edwin had been sneaking into the storyteller's tree. His old legs weren't used to all that exercise, and they were protesting. Edwin's whole body, for that matter, wasn't happy with him. Although Edwin hadn't had a good night's sleep in decades, he at least usually managed four or five sporadic hours. Now, because of his nocturnal forays into the baobab tree, he was grabbing only an hour or two before dawn, uh, forced him awake and pushed him into his day. Rubbing the dried rheum, I don't know what that word is, R-H-E-U-M, rheum, rheum, that had accumulated at the corner of his eyes in the short time he'd slept, oh, it's, a, it's the thingy that is in your eye, uh, Edwin looked around the sad, lonely space where he spent his nights. The dirty, peach-coloured walls were bare, the scant furniture in the room, the bed he sat on, a scarred dresser, and a wobbly nightstand, had come with the rental. Edwin had added nothing of his own when he'd moved in, nothing but his clothes and toiletries, a handful of books and a small item that sat dingy and beleaguered on top of the dresser. Edwin knew he shouldn't have kept it, but he couldn't bring himself to throw it away. It was the only thing he had left of a time that he shouldn't have been allowed to forget, now that he hadn't tried. What was the item? What was the item? We're going to find out about it in a future story, I'm telling you. Um, not that he hadn't tried. Edwin had spent the better part of three decades trying to forget. He'd run as far away as he could, all the way around the world, until one day he'd run out of money. Hmm, three decades, huh? Thirty years. Thirty years. Um, until one day he'd run out of money. 
Then he'd been forced to come back and demand that Fazbear Enterprises honoured their buyout agreement. If anyone had told Edwin 40 years before that this is where he'd end up, he'd have laughed himself silly. Edwin Murray in a place like this? No way. Edwin Murray was a brilliant engineer, a creative genius. He was destined for great things. This hadn't just been Edwin's 24-year-old uh, ego talking. Your company is going to change the world, Fiona had told him every morning when he got up and went to the old warehouse where he tinkered with his inventions and built his machines. Life had been so full of promise then. Yes, money was tight at first, but Edwin started breaking through the financial wall and he and Fiona were able to move into a large fixer-upper house. The house was an old Queen Anne mansion, and they planned to restore it all to its former grandeur. By then, Fiona was pregnant, and she was bursting with ideas for their child's nursery and playroom. But then, the bubble burst. The promise, it turned out, had been a lie. Fiona had died in childbirth. Edwin had been left alone with a baby boy who never stopped crying. Oh, but how Edwin loved that little boy. Even lost in his own grief, Edwin had poured himself into learning to be a good dad. If only. Edwin rubbed his eyes roughly, wiping away his memories and forcing himself to face the present. Oh! He accidentally... His invention killed his son. I bet. I bet that's what it is. I bet that's what it is. And the invention was the mimic. I think that's probably what it's going to be. That would be a reveal. Uh, Edwin rubbed his eyes roughly, wiping away his memories and forcing himself to face the present. He stood and shuffled into the tiny space that served as his bathroom. Avoiding the mirror, he pulled off the sweat-stained white t-shirt he'd worn to bed. Stripping the rest of the way, Edwin turned on a water-spotted faucet and ducked into the pathetic drizzle that spurted from the old lime-clogged shower head. The trickle of warmth that sluiced over Edwin might have been weak, but it cleared his head, a tiny bit of his despair slur uh, sloughed away, and he remembered the night's triumph. Mr. Burrows adjusted the collar of his indigo blue polo shirt as he stepped onto the main concourse of the pizzaplex. The cotton fabric was slightly moist. The temperature outside was warm enough that even though he changed clothes after his morning round of golf, he was already sweating again by the time he got to the pizzaplex. Mr. Burrows inhaled deeply, satisfying himself that the sandalwood scent of his subtle cologne was masking any unseemingly perspiration odour. He hated to smell. It was uh, undignified. Not that any scent of his own could be picked out from the myriad aromas filling the pizzaplex. In just one inhale, Mr. Burrows noted the scents of spicy pizza sauce, sickly sweet cotton candy, buttery popcorn and fruity bubblegum, as well as the odours of dirty socks and even dirtier diapers. The latter wrinkled his nose, and the, and the pervasive smell of harsh cleaning fluids made his eyes burn. He knew why the Pizzaplex janitorial staff had to use bleach and other caustic chemicals, but he didn't like to breathe them in. For some reason, that's reminding me of Haps. You know, Haps was like made to go around the tubes and like spray the disinfectant around. I don't know why that reminded me of that, but uh, it could be like somewhat connected. Um, generally, even though Mr. Burrows was the head of Fazbear Entertainment, he spent little to no time in the company's venues. Mr. Burrows had achieved his position based on his programming and business skills, not on his love of games and robots and pizza. Honestly, he thought most of what Fazbear Entertainment created was frivolous, even stupid. But he sought a position with the company right out of college because Fazbear Entertainment was a wildly successful corporation, and he aspired to be the head of such an enterprise. He also had a knack for creating games, however much he didn't enjoy playing them. It was the challenge that he liked, he supposed. Creating games and story-driven entertainment was like putting together a complex puzzle. Mr. Burroughs enjoyed mastering that kind of intricate thought. Mr. Burroughs' current conundrum was challenge as well, but this one didn't entertain him. It annoyed him. What was Murray up to? Mr. Burroughs had gotten to the point in his career where he was a little more than a, de a delegator most of the time, and that suited him. He'd planned since age five to be a multi-millionaire by the time he was 30. He'd missed the mark by a couple of years, but he was where he wanted to be now. Although he had a knack for business, he much preferred play to work. He applied himself not so he could work more and more, but so that he could afford his hobbies. Mr. Burroughs had expensive hobbies. Golf was the most affordable. Mr. Burroughs also loved yachts, scuba diving, and collecting art. 
This was why Murray was starting to annoy him. Mr. Burroughs was missing a regatta this weekend because he needed to see for himself what was going on with the storyteller. According to the employees who monitored such things, many of the Peterplex shows were morphing in strange ways, and several of the characters associated with various attractions, like Monty's Gator Golf, Roxy Raceway, Fazer Blast, and Bonnie Bowl, were exhibiting unusual behaviours. One of the Mr. Burroughs, one of Mr. Burroughs' advisors had suggested that the storyteller itself might have been creating the anomalies, but Mr. Burroughs was sure Murray was responsible. Oh, come on. <laughs> Um, I mean, actually, to be honest, both are true, if if Murray made the um, the mimic. Mr. Burroughs' unpleasant visit to the raucous, crowded pizzaplex today had a twofold purpose. He wanted to see for himself what was happening to the stage shows and what the characters were doing. He also hoped to catch Murray in the act of sneaking into the storyteller tree. It was this catch-him-red-handed task that Burroughs took on first, because the pizzaplex's main dining room had the best view of the tree, Mr. Burroughs positioned himself at a table near the dining room's entrance, and he ordered a pizza. The pizza. Mr. Burroughs had opted for a veggie pizza with artichoke hearts and sun-dried tomatoes. Wasn't bad. But how in the world was someone expected to digest food in this atmosphere? Mr. Burroughs liked bright colours, but even he had to admit this was technically gar uh, garish. It was delight, he decided as he chewed the pizza. LEDs and neon lighting were everywhere. LED lights wrapped the tabletops and traced the perimeters of the black and white checkerboard squares on the floor. The archway leading into the dining room was neon, and neon pizza wedges decorated the walls. Their colors in your face red, blues, greens, yellows, pinks, purples, and oranges. All this light was caught by the mirrored ceiling and refracted sending streaks of color throughout the space. Even the servers threw out light. They all had multicoloured glow necklaces hanging around their necks. And then, there was the noise. Um, why did children have to scream so much? Sorry, I was just... I had a really stupid theory just now. I was just like... He, he said that the servers throughout light, they had multicoloured glow necklaces hanging around their necks. And I immediately was... Immediate was uh, I was immediately like... Oh my god, they they all have the heart-shaped pendants. <laughs> they're all using illusion technology because they're staff bots that are disguising themselves as humans. So actually, they were staff bots the entire time. Uh, like Gregory. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Burroughs endured the commotion as long as he could, but after an hour of nursing a soda and watching a couple little boys chew with their mouths open, Mr. Burroughs had to get out of the dining room. He hadn't spotted Murray. He decided to give up on this task and check out the animatronic characters. Mr. Burroughs, ro uh, Mr. Burroughs wove his way through an adrenaline-driven crowd of screaming, sticky children and overstimulated adults. He checked his Rolex. His timing wasn't ideal. He was between stage shows. No matter. He figured he could get a sense of the character's antics if he visited Rockstar Row. Between shows, the main performers, Glamrock Freddy, Roxanne Wolf, Montgomery Gator, and Glamrock Chica, hung out in their green rooms. Mr. Burroughs stepped around a small boy crying because he dropped his pinwheel sucker, and he headed into the neon star-lined uh, area filled with glass-fronted cases that featured a collection of props used by both old and new animatronics. Mr. Burroughs strode toward Glamrock Freddy's green room. Green Room was a misnomer for the red-walled area that was Glamrock Freddy's domain. Above the red walls, a giant bright blue neon star dominated the ceiling. There was nothing green about the room. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> this is a long day. Um, the space was stuffed with various forms of Freddy's visage. The bear's face was painted on the wall and displayed on posters, and the room held a large sculpture of Glamrock Freddy, as well as an oversized plush doll version of the character. And right now, the room also held Glamrock Freddy, but he wasn't at his best. Glamrock Freddy was a massive bear who sported a black bow tie and a top hat in skirt, encircled by a blue stripe. His body was painted bright orange and yellow with a turquoise lighting bolt, lightning bolt on his chest, and his broad shoulders were decorated with substantial red shoulder pads. He wore spiked bracelets and a red earring in his left ear. In other words, Glamrock Freddy was badass, usually. Right now, however, Freddy was acting more like a spoiled brat than a rock star. Mr. Burroughs' eyebrows arched as he watched Glamrock Freddy engage in a tugging match with a small pigtailed girl. The object being tugged was a furry plush version of a vintage Freddy Fazbear. That's mine! 
the little girl screeched as she determinedly grasped the bear's arm. Glamrock Freddy ignored her and continued to attempt to pull the bear from the little girl's clenched hand. The girl's mother, a young brunette with a prominent blue nose ring, stepped forward and used her shoulder-length denim purse to swat Freddy on the arm. Stop that, the mother demanded. Let's go. Uh-oh, Mr. Burroughs thought. He started toward the girl, the bear, and the mother. Before Mr. Burroughs took one step, though, Freddy let go of the plush version of his predecessor. The sudden release of tension sent the girl reeling backward into her mother's embrace. But Gregory, you need to vent. <laughs> Vanessa? Uh, Mr. Burroughs? Mr. Burroughs continued to rush forward, but not sure what Glamrock Freddy would do next. The animatronics, although programmed to be entertaining and fun, were powerful machines. If they went off program, they could be dangerous. But Mr. Burroughs needn't have worried. Not about a hazard, anyway. He was, however, very concerned about the story program running the bear because Glamrock Freddy turned his back on the girl and her mother, stomped to the far side of his green room, hunched his shoulders, and started to cry. What in the name of all things Fazbear is going on here? Mr. Burroughs asked himself. Murray, he muttered. Something was rotten in the state of the pizzaplex, and Mr. Burroughs was going to root it out and get rid of it. Turning on his heel, Mr. Burroughs stalked out of Rockstar Row. He'd seen enough. Now, all he had to do was decide how to remedy the situation. Mr. Burroughs, ploughing through the pizzaplex's hoi polloi, was thinking about the next steps instead of focusing on where he was going. It wasn't a surprise. Therefore, when he suddenly tripped over a toddler who had, for unfathomable reasons, sat down on the floor with a large orange crayon to draw a picture on one of the white floor tiles. Mr. Burroughs windmilled his arms, but was unable to keep himself from hitting the floor. He landed flat on his face, uh, flat on his back, face up. Mr. Burroughs managed to grit his teeth against the curse that wanted to come out. As several well-meaning kids and adults gathered around him, asking him if he was okay, he blinked to clear his vision. The view from the floor was an interesting one. Mr. Burroughs' eyes were mildly unfocused, and the sea of faces against the rainbow-coloured backdrop of the storyteller's tree branches was bizarre, to say the least. Mr. Burroughs felt like he'd fallen into a surreal painting. Seeking a focal point to get his bearings, he looked past the faces, up through the tree branches to the pizzaplex atrium's glass roof, and that was when it hit him. He knew how Murray was getting into the storyteller's tree. Mr. Burroughs let a couple of strangers help him to his feet. He waved off concerned questions, excused himself, and hurried toward the Pizzaplex exit. First order of business was a shower. Mr. Burroughs didn't even want to think about the amount of bacteria on the concourse floor. Second order of business, get one of the tree's engineers into his office. If what Mr. Burroughs suspected was true, he now knew what to do next. Ooh. Mr. Burroughs had what he needed by the following Tuesday evening. Sebastian, the lead engineer on the Storyteller Tree Project, brought it to Mr. Burroughs at the end of the day. This should do it, Mr. Burroughs, Sebastian said as he crouched next to the end of Mr. Burroughs' credenza. Sebastian, a tall, broad-shouldered guy with chin-length blonde hair he never seemed to comb, finished connecting a couple of wires. This control pad will give you command of all the tree's mechanisms. Good work, Mr. Burroughs said. Sebastian's mouth twisted. I'm really sorry about the security snafu. We just never thought anyone would figure out the catwalk mechanism, so we didn't think to install security cameras up there or lock down the top of the tree. Sebastian's shoulders rounded toward or forward as if he expected to be disciplined for the oversight. Don't worry about it, Mr. Burroughs said magnanimously. <laughs> uh, yeah, he looked away from Sebastian. The man's red Fazbear Entertainment uniform shirt was a size too small, and it rode up his back, away from his black pants, exposing more of Sebastian than Mr. Burroughs wanted to see. Sebastian glanced up. His thick bra black brows were bunched. Clearly, he was expecting a dressing down. <clears throat> Mr. Burroughs had to admit that he was usually not known for his forgiving nature, so he understood Sebastian's trepidation. In this case, however, the engineer's mistakes were fortuitous. Fortu fortuitous. Yeah, <laughs> that word. Uh, after he showered on Saturday, uh, Mr. Rose had gone to his office and started issuing orders. The first set of orders had confirmed what Mr. Burroughs had suspected. The top of the tree had lacked security. The second set of ordered orders had put the tech team to work, retasking several of the CCTV cameras. 
this had resulted in a fine clear video of Murray sneaking into the tree from the top and then exiting the tree the same way a couple hours later. As he'd watched the video, Mr. Burroughs had smiled. Murray thought he was getting away with something. He was wrong. In fact, Mr. Murray, <laughs> Mr. Murray, in fact, Murray was going to walk right into Mr. Burroughs' trap. You're all set, Sebastian said, rising to his feet and tugging his shirt into place. Thank you, Sebastian, Mr. Burroughs said. Mr. Burroughs turned to look at his new control panel. He grinned. He couldn't wait to use it. I just had a thought. Am I wrong in saying that rabbits live in burrows? Am I wrong with that? <laughs> that sounds right to me. Because if rabbits live in burrows, maybe that's a glitch trap metaphor. Like, like spoilers for GGY if you if you didn't read that one first. But like in that one, Gregory was called Doctor Rabbit. And that's how you know, like, it's it's something to do with glitch trap. So, is, is the fact that this guy is called Mr. Burrows, is that related in any way to rabbits and glitch trap, maybe? Maybe Mr. Burrows is evil. Oh, I never thought about that. That, that could be interesting to look into. I don't think it is, is a thing, but, like, that would be interesting. It'd be an interesting narrative and a cool clue as well. Mr. Burroughs only had to wait a few hours before he got to put his new control pad through its paces. By then, it was 11.26pm. Mr. Burroughs hadn't bothered to come home that evening. He'd had Cecilia get him Chinese takeout, and he'd enjoyed a excellent per pe Peking roasted duck? Or pecking roasted duck? I don't know. After he ate, Mr. Burroughs had reviewed the storyteller tree specs. He knew the tree had the features necessary to implement his plan but he liked to be thorough. He double-checked everything. As he'd already been aware, the interior of the storyteller tree was airtight. The hollow portion of the tree had been designed that way in order to maintain the optimal conditions for the storyteller's processes. Once the tree was closed up, whatever oxygen that had entered the room when its doors were open was all the oxygen available. The tree had no venting system. <clears throat> When Murray was sneaking into the tree, he was leaving the top of the tree open while he was inside. That provided him with enough air. While he waited for Murray to show up and slip into the tree, Mr. Burrow's gaze had repeatedly gone to his, con his new control pad. He now had the capacity to close and lock the top of the tree. The thought made him want to rub his hands together in glee. And finally, it was time. Mr. Burrow saw movement on the flat screen behind his desk. He watched as the catwalk started extending out toward the top of the tree. And yep, there he was, the little weasel. Murray didn't wait a second once the catwalk stopped moving. He scurried along the narrow walkway and crawled down inside the tree. Mr. Burroughs counted slowly to 60. He figured that would be plenty of time for Murray to get to the bottom of the tree trunk. Would Murray notice the panels at the top of the tree close? Mr. Burroughs didn't care. Murray would find out soon enough that he couldn't get out when he tried to leave the tree. With a dramatic flourish that he enjoyed immensely, Mr. Burroughs pushed a button on his new control panel. He tapped a couple keys on his keyboard, and the image on the, on the flat screen shifted. Now it showed the panel closing at the top of the tree. Gotcha, Mr. Burroughs said out loud. Now that the tree was closed off, Mr. Burroughs could, do, could no longer see Murray. Security cameras couldn't be placed inside the tree. The storyteller's functions kept causing the cameras to glitch. Mr. Burroughs could now only imagine what Murray was doing inside the tree. Mr. Burroughs frowned. Was what he'd done the act of a gentleman? For an instant, he was beset by doubt. The instant was short, though. Locking Murray inside the tree was absolutely the right thing to do, for the good of Fazbear Entertainment, of course. Mr. Bur- <laughs> Not Mr. Murray. Murray was an expensive employee. The salary specified by his buyout contract was scandalous. Man, uh, Murray was also a bothersome employee. His interference had been an issue on other projects, but his meddling with the storyteller was dangerous. Given that Mr. Burroughs couldn't fire Murray without costing Fazbear millions in legal fees, Mr. Burroughs was doing right by the company to remove Murray's potentially disastrous tampering. Besides, Murray had brought this on himself. He knew he wasn't permitted inside the tree. He'd defied the rules, and defying rules had consequences. Murray was only getting what he deserved. 
In spite of his conviction that he'd done the right thing, Mr. Burroughs' thoughts were dominated by Murray's confinement within the tree all through the rest of the week and even over the weekend. Mr. Burroughs and a particularly lovely model had flown had flown to Cozumel for a scuba diving exertion on Friday evening, but nothing about diving in the pristine waters distracted Mr. Burroughs from images of Murray trying to batter his way up the tree. Monday morning, Mr. Burroughs went to his work with his muscles in knots. He half expected to be greeted by his security team, or worse, by law enforcement personnel. Security... Oh my god, I'm so bad at reading. Surely, Murray had made an attempt to exit the tree, and that attempt could easily have been heard. When Celia greeted Mr. Burroughs with his usual morning espresso, however, she was alone, and she said nothing about the storyteller tree. Anything that needs my immediate attention? Mr. Burroughs asked Cecilia. I keep saying Cecilia, it's, it's just Celia. Nothing at all, Mr. Burroughs, Celia said as she set the espresso cup on his blotter. Just the board meeting this afternoon. Good, good, Mr. Burroughs said. What was Murray doing? Mr. Burroughs wondered. Why wasn't he trying to get out? Mr. Burroughs mulled this question over and over as the days passed. He was barely aware of what was discussed during the board meeting. All he could do was stare at Murray's empty chair. He only half paid attention to the paperwork that came across his desk. In the late afternoon, Mr. Burroughs met with some of the storyteller's programming team, to discuss the strange character behaviour being reported from nearly all the Pizzaplex venues. When someone suggested going into the tree to run a full diagnostic on the storyteller, Mr. Burroughs choked. When he stopped sputtering, he, ha he said, No, let's just wait and see what unfolds. The storyteller probably has a long-term plan. Let's see what it is. This comment garnered Mr. Burroughs a few odd looks. He ended the meeting right after that. This is giving me... um. Similar vibes to Cooking Companions, if you've ever played that or seen the playthrough of that, where like you lock the girl in the in like the basement, uh, and then you get like you you get paranoid. You like you start seeing her everywhere, and like uh, it, it's all like psychological horror. Uh, really cool, really cool game. If you want to go check it out, Cooking Companions. Um, maybe Murray had suffered a heart attack when he realised he was trapped, Mr. Burroughs concluded the next day. He could come up with no explanation for why Murray wasn't trying to get out. Unless... At the end of Tuesday afternoon, a full week after Mr. Burroughs unlocked Murray in the tree, Mr. Burroughs concluded that Murray was somehow sneaking in and out of the tree in a way that was eluding Mr. Burroughs. Was there a trapdoor Mr. Burroughs didn't know about? Had Murray defeated the panel lock and sabotaged the camera feeds? That had to be it. Somehow... The old guy had outsmarted Mr. Burroughs. Mr. Burroughs hated entertaining this idea, but it was the only explanation he could come up with for why M Murray had never made a racket demanding to get out. Mr. Burroughs very much wanted to consult the engineers to see if any of his theories were possible, but doing that would potentially expose what he'd done. No, he had to look into it himself. The best thing, Mr. Burroughs, uh, Burroughs decided, would be to confront Murray directly, and he was going to do that this evening, during the busiest time in the Pizzaplex. Although, as the chairman of the board, Mr. Burroughs had every right to access any part of the Pizzaplex any time he wanted to. He didn't want to draw attention to his entrance into the tree. He figured if he approached the tree when the concourse was at its busiest, his presence might not even be noticed. By the time he reached the Pizzaplex, Mr. Burroughs had worked himself up into a full froth of anger, Murray was such an enormous pain in Mr. Burroughs' backside, he couldn't even die properly. Mr. Burroughs couldn't wait to get his hands on Murray. He wanted to shake the old man until his teeth fell out of his, hand, uh, out of his head. As Mr. Burroughs had known it would be, the atrium was packed, eh. The stage shows were going full blast, and the audiences had spilled into the open space around the tree. Rock music blasted from every speaker in the building. Couples danced. Little kids spun like tiny dervishes. Older kids roughhoused or played air guitar. It was dense. Exuberant chaos. The noise hurt Mr. Burroughs' ears, and he had to endure a half dozen elbows and shoulder bumps as he made his way to the tree. But the commotion was perfect. No one was going to notice him. Mr. Burroughs slipped between two girls jumping up and down and a young couple too wrapped up in each other to notice anything else. He hurried up to the tree's hidden door. Mr. Burroughs watched the palm scanner appear, he placed his palm on the screen. The door made a soft whooshing sound as it slid open. Mr. Burroughs ducked in through the six-foot doorway. 
As soon as he was inside the hollow tree, the door snicked closed behind him. Mr. Burrows whirled around. For a moment, he panicked. Then he chastised himself. His palm was his key to get out. Everything was fine. He turned back around and he froze. What's all this? Mr. Burrows asked. No one answered. Frowning, Mr. Burrows gazed around at the most unexpected sight. He wasn't sure what he thought he'd find when he faced off with Murray inside the tree. He supposed he'd find Murray hunched over the computer keyboard, trying to rewrite the storyteller's program. Instead, he didn't see Murray at all. Maybe the old guy hadn't slipped back into the tree yet. But clearly, he'd been here. What was all this? What had Murray been doing in here? The entire interior of the hollow tree trunk, to about six feet up the wall, was plastered with large sheets of construction paper. The paper was in an array of colours, but each sheet was marked up with plain black marker. Sticky note room? I uh, Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> it, it could be connected in that way, but probably not. Every sheet of paper was covered with odd stick drawings and strange symbols that were not at all familiar to Mr. Burroughs. Squiggles, squares, loops, triangles within triangles, mathematical equations, nonsensical ones from what Mr. Burroughs could tell, were tangled up in the symbols. And written over the top of all of this, on nearly every sheet of construction paper, were two words. I'm sorry. What did it all mean? For a full minute, Mr. Burroughs circled the interior of the tree. He barely glanced at the storyteller, which was plastered with construction paper as well. He just kept looking up at the walls, trying to decipher what must have been some kind of code that he didn't understand. He puzzled over what he was seeing. Until his foot came up against an obstruction, Mr. Burroughs looked down. He gasped and covered his mouth with his hand. Mr. Burroughs had been wrong. Murray hadn't been sneaking in and out for the last week. He'd never left, and now he never would. Half buried under a mound of blank construction paper, Murray was sitting, doubled over, a crayon clutched in his curled, motionless right hand. Unquestionably deceased, his eyes were wide open and cloudy. Murray appeared to have died in the middle of scribbling yet another odd stick figure. He'd already written, I'm sorry, on the paper. His left hand lay above the words, palm up, as if asking for forgiveness. Ooh. Mr. Burroughs backed away from Murray's corpse. He stumbled, and abruptly, he was gripped by the need to get out the tree. Every one of his nerve endings was screaming run, even though the only thing in the hollow tree besides Murray was the storyteller, and all the benign sheets of construction paper, Mr. Burroughs suddenly felt like he was standing in the midst of a contagion. He had to get away from it. Whipping toward the door in a panic, Mr. Burroughs accessed the palm reader display. He put a now trembling hand on the screen and waited for the door to whisk open. Nothing happened. Mr. Burroughs pressed his palm to the glass again. Nothing. Then it dawned on him what was going on. No, Mr. Burroughs shouted. How could he have been so stupid? He'd forgotten that the button he'd pushed on the control pad Sebastian had so helpfully installed on the credenza in Mr. Burroughs' office overrode every function in the tree. The command Mr. Burroughs had given in his office when he'd locked in Murray had rendered Mr. Burroughs' palm completely ineffective inside the tree. He was trapped. Mr. Burroughs didn't hesitate. He immediately began pounding on the tree's exit door. He battered it with his fists. He kicked it with his leather-soled shoes. He also screamed. He shouted. He bellowed. Hey, in here. Get security. I'm trapped in here. He yelled over and over. In a matter of minutes, Mr. Burroughs was gasping for air, his heart thundering in his chest. He put his ear to the door. As if from a great distance, Mr. Burroughs could hear the sound of children playing. He took in a gulp of air and bellowed it as loudly as he could. Help me! He once again pressed his ear to the door. The children continued to laugh and scream, but it was no use. No one was going to hear him. Trying to control his racing heart, Mr. Burroughs scanned the small space. Think, he commanded himself. I'm a smart guy, he thought. I can figure this out. Mr. Burroughs' gaze landed on the cables that extended from the storyteller. Of course. If he broke the connection between the storyteller and the pizzaplex, the attractions would malfunction. Someone would come, right? Right, he told himself. Mr. Burroughs dove toward the cables that stretched out from the base of the storyteller. Grabbing them with both hands, he jerked the cables away from the storyteller's metal platform. The cables came free easily. But even when they did, the storyteller, its white metal tiger head, 
lit up like a starry sky. Didn't go dark. Mr. Burroughs growled in frustration. Scrambling to his feet, he began pummeling the storyteller. Stop running, he screamed at it. The storyteller remained lit up. Enraged, Mr. Burroughs grabbed one of the storyteller's arms. He put his full weight into it and snapped the arm off the tiger head. The tiger head began to glow, or continued to glow, sorry. On some level, aware what he was doing was pointless, Mr. Burroughs nonetheless attacked the next arm violently, grunting as he yanked at the thing. He broke it off, then went for the next arm. And the next, he wrenched off all four arms. As the metal appendages tore free, a tangle of wires flowed from the storyteller's shoulder sockets like a stream of vessels and veins. Mr. Burroughs began beating the storyteller's tiger muzzle in seconds. His fists were bloody, and it was getting hard to breathe. Mr. Burroughs sank to the floor and put his head in his hands. He started to sob. Then he raised his hand. Idiot, he snapped. Staggering to his feet, Mr. Burroughs lunged toward the storyteller's control keypad. He typed in his password. The screen flashed. Password failed. What? Mr. Burroughs wailed. Once again, he collapsed to the floor. The control pad command had counterman uh, countermanded his access to the program too. He couldn't shut down the storyteller. Mr. Burroughs sucked in air, and he realised that it was becoming harder to take in enough oxygen to breathe. He was beginning to feel lightheaded. Mr. Burroughs looked up, his gaze scanning the metal rungs leading to the top of the tree. Would he be heard if he pounded on the exit panel? He tried to stand, but he couldn't. It wouldn't have worked anyway, he knew. No one would have heard him beating on the top of the tree. It was all useless. There was no way out. Even so, Mr. Burroughs' fury and his refusal to believe the facts of his situation sent him crawling back toward the doorway. He lay on his back and kicked at the door with every ounce of his strength. Help! he shrieked. Help me! He screeched and hollered, keening in high-pitched howls. Someone had to hear him. Okay. Kids loved the storyteller tree. The chunky trunk, with its swollen belly-like appearance, made the little kids giggle, and it made the older kids wish they could get inside of it. Kids of all ages liked to circumnavigate the tree, chasing one another until they dropped. Wait. Wait. Kids... I swear that's not the end. I swear that's not the end. I swear there's like... Okay, when I swear... Like, this, that could be the end. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I've ruined the moment there. But like, I think there was... I swear there's another line, and I think my... Like, the website is bugging or something. But I swear to God, there is another line that's like... Um, but after all of this, like... All of the kids still wonder what was inside the storyteller's tree. And then that was like the final line or something, um, which is like a really chilling line to me, at least, because and like mem very memorable because we know what went on inside the storyteller's tree. We know who the storyteller is and we know what's inside the storyteller's tree. Just two dead guys with a bunch of construction paper saying, I'm sorry. Turns out they're they are the, uh, you know, the executives, the board of directors. Sorry. Uh, yeah. It's it's a pretty good story, okay? I, like, I don't think this one is going to, like, stand out as, like, one of the favourites. But I thought it was pretty good. It held some really cool themes. And I feel like this is, like, one of, like, a trilogy, I would say. Because we have got the story called The Mimic coming up in the next book. And that one has a character called Edwin in it. And after that, we have got... Tales from the Pizza Plex number seven, which is, of course, Tiger Rock. Uh, and that is about the tiger. So I'm assuming this is going to be like a kind of trilogy situation, not necessarily like a continuity, but kind of like three different, um, looking at three different aspects of this whole thing uh, and seeing how Glitchstrap came to be in the Pizza Plex and understanding what the mimic is, um, because that's very interesting too because it connects to the epilogues. This story is really connected. I really love it. I really love what they did with the characters. I actually really like how they did the board of directors, and I like how it ties into other stories. And I think it's generally quite a good story. The only thing is, I would say, it has kind of just been done before. 
Um, because, like, I don't know about you guys, but, like, when it said, like, there was no oxygen, there was no ventilation or anything in the storyteller's tree, I was just like, okay, it's pretty obvious what's going to happen here. When they said that the pizza plex was completely packed and, like, everything was so loud, like, we knew what was going on. It gave me similar vibes to Fine Player 2, which, don't get me wrong, is an amazing story. Gave me similar vibes to Haps, in a way, because they were, like, trapped in there uh, and the pizza plex was so loud that nobody could, could hear the screams. Yeah, I, I think, like... I think it had very similar themes, and we've kind of heard this sort of story before. But I did still like uh, how this one turned out, and, and I think it is a pretty good story. Let me know what you think, though, in the comments below. There's a lot of theorizable content here, so um, let me know what you believe as well. Make sure you subscribe, and we are doing Bobby Dots Part 2 next time. Be excited. That's going to start tomorrow, probably. Um, and yeah, Bobby Dust Part 2 is incredible. So I hope to see you there. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I'll see you later. Goodbye.